All right, well in this series, Godly Conflict, we're going to look at largely Matthew 18, and we're going to look at the concept of how you deal with conflict, how are you supposed to deal with conflict, um, you know, what's the good and the bad of conflict, all that stuff. So let's look at Matthew 18 first off. If your brother sins against you, go, tell him his fault, between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to if he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. So, the first, uh, the first, well, before we get into why should we care about conflict, uh, let's kind of talk about what is conflict. So, I could describe it pretty broadly. I could say ongoing butting heads or antagonisms and fights or opposition between two people or more, two or more people. Um, you could say a difficult situation can be a conflict. And you could say a life problem or difficulty is a conflict. I think I'd like to go with this. A conflict is a thing, situation, or person that keep you up at night, stay on your mind. It is basically a life tension. And these tensions are everywhere. We all deal with them at all times. Um, sometimes we kind of like to blind ourselves to it. Oh, I'm not really in, in conflict because, you know, I'm a good Christian or whatever. And that's just, that's just silly. Everybody has conflict. It's important that we recognize it, deal with it, and grow from it. So that brings up the question, why, why or why should we care about how to deal with conflict as a Christian? And there's a lot of things that you could say, but I've listed just a few things that I thought of myself. Because everyone around us is fighting about everything, and we will get sucked in. If we don't learn how to deal with conflict, we will get sucked into the conflict of the culture around us. Everybody around us is upset about something, and we'll just follow along. Secondly, because Christianity is led by the Prince of Peace, and therefore we should be mimicking him. And lastly, because we are going to experience conflict no matter what we do. So... Um, one of the things that is important is that as Christians, we can be building God's kingdom or Satan's. And one of the things that builds Satan's kingdom is how we deal with others, how we, how we have conflict with others. Are we tearing them down and gossiping and complaining, or are we building them up? One of the big things that separated the Old Testament law from the other laws of, of the time, of the ancient world, was that the biblical law was focused on how we treat our neighbors— and that was connected with uh, with worship. To truly honor and worship and love God, you have to you have to love people, and that was one of the big things that separated um, the Old Testament law from the uh, other pagan laws. So that's those are some good reasons why we should care about how to deal with conflict. And more so, I think there's four biblical considerations to really think about. Um, moving forward. The first one is our love is determined by those we love the least, not those we love the most. So are you a loving person or do you love those who are easy to love? Sometimes, oh, I, I love everyone. It's like, no, you just avoid the people you don't like and only surround yourself with the people who you love. Matthew 5, 46 says, for if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? So our love is determined by those who love the least. If, if, if you are a loving person, this will come out by who you love the least, not who you love the most. Number two, obedience to God demands dealing with conflict. It demands it. You, 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 cannot, you cannot disobey God and but you cannot disobey God by not dealing with conflict. So if you want to obey God, if you want to be on good terms with God, you have to obey him. And obeying God demands that you deal with it. Colossians 3, 12-13 says, As God's chosen ones, holy and duly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And think about how those things apply to your relationship with other people. Patience, for instance, towards your kids or towards your wife. Bearing one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another. 
So as your, the Bible says that as your Father in heaven has done for you, you are to do for them. And it's one of those things where, yes, God says that he will not forgive us if we don't forgive others. It's absolutely important that we learn how to deal with conflict because it's a command from God. Third off, dedication to God is shown by love for others. It's shown by our love for others. If we are really dedicated to God, we, we will love others, which means that will affect how we deal with conflict. And this goes back to what I was telling you, what I was mentioning about the Old Testament law. So Micah 6 8 says, Mankind he has told each of you what is good and what it is what it is the Lord requires of you, to act justly. That's how we treat people. To love faithfulness. That's how we treat people and how we treat God. And to walk humbly with your God. That's obviously how we treat God. But notice how our requirement of treating others comes before how we walk with God. And it's not about, you know, look look the part and do all the things right. It's walk humbly with your God. Um, realizing you know who you really are and also one more verse first john 4 20 says if anyone says i love god and yet hates his brother or sister he is a liar so truly being dedicated to god means that how you treat others will be changed uh, and i don't want you to think love um think of love as, as like a feeling a lot of people in the culture see it as a feeling you know love is love that kind of stuff it, it, it's all focused on feeling how i feel and that just determines what's real and, it, and love is also not something that is necessarily said. A lot of people say, I love you, but they don't really mean it. They'll, they'll leave it the first sign of, of, of problems. Love is more an action. It's something that is done. It, we see the perfect example of love with Jesus. Everyone, everyone, everyone thinks that they love others. Oh, I'm a loving person. But the truth is that actions, attitudes, and words, they reveal the heart. It's easy to say and believe that you love others, but really look at how you treat others, your attitude towards others, and what you say towards others, and that will reveal what's really going on. And lastly, of these four biblical considerations is this. Ministry is decided from your conflict. It's, it's determined by it. Sam Chand once said that your capacity as a leader, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, your capacity as a leader is limited by how much pain you can endure. Another word for pain would be conflict. So however much, your, your pain threshold will determine how far you go as a leader. So uh, two verses that I think really apply to this is Colossians 4 or 5, act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the, most of the time. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, 12, behave properly in the presence of outsiders. And I haven't written down the whole verses here. Uh, by all means, go and read them. Absolutely, yes. Uh, I just wanted you to get the idea that I'm trying to talk about is that ministry is decided from our conflict. Um, I served a lot of time as a worship leader. And a lot of times worship leaders will no, never go from good to great because they don't know how to handle conflict. They don't know how to interact with people. They think it's all about the music, so they get like real spiritual, like, oh, I'm so great, I'm so godly, I'm so, I'm, I'm so amazing, you know, I'm so much more spiritual than, than the pastor. Um, in fact, one of the conflicts that I've dealt excessively with, with in the past is worship leaders who think that they're more spiritual than the pastor, so they have like these conflicts between the two of them, who's the most spiritual? Uh, and it filters into the home, too. Am I more spiritual or is my wife more spiritual? Whenever I answer that I'm more spiritual, it's a sure sign that I'm not headed in a good place. But when it's my wife is more spiritual, it's typically that I'm in a, in a much better place. So uh, worship leaders oftentimes don't understand that how they treat others and view others, that is literally holding back their ministry. It's not people or toxic people that hold back your ministry. Dealing with problems is ministry. You're dealing with people, you're witnessing to them, you're, you're ministering to them. Absolutely, that's not, that's not something that handicaps your ministry. That is your ministry. But if you can't deal with conflicts, you can't deal with people, you don't have a ministry. Pastors who will never move their church to the next level because they don't love people enough to work through the conflict. Maybe, you know, those, those kinds of people come to the church and they just don't really want to, want to deal with that. The, the new generation comes to the church and they have to relearn the things that they, that they used to be able to, be, be able to do. Um, people they don't want to the church, situations they avoid dealing with. Things that's like, eh, I just don't, uh. And so they, they don't learn to grow past that. And every pastor has a blind spot. I mean, I speak as a pastor who was under pastors for a long time, too. Um, every pastor has that people group that they just don't like dealing with. It could be um, older, white, 
conservative people who've been saved a long time. It could be um, drug addicts. It could be transgenders. It really doesn't matter which group it is. Every pastor has that group. And they'll never move their church to the next level because they don't love people enough to work through the conflict. Maybe they just want to brush it under the rug. Maybe they just want to ignore it. Maybe they don't want to stand their ground. Maybe there's a conflict with their staff and they don't want to actually deal with it. They just want to kind of let it go and see if it plays out. And so everybody around them is losing losing trust in them because they won't deal with the problem. But at the same time, they don't want to deal with the problem. Um, another example of ministry dis- being decided from conflict is church members who would rather build Satan's kingdom than God's by nitpicking, gossiping, complaining, fighting with one another, saying snide comments, all kinds of stuff like that. So um, uh, there's this idea that I love Jesus, but I don't want to deal with people. I don't want to change. And it's, it's, that's just not really um, realistic. So let's let's read through uh, let's read through Matthew eighteen fifteen through twenty again. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. So the first thing that we can ask ourselves in looking at this verse is. Is it your preference or a sin? That comes out at the very beginning. It says, if your brother sins against you. Well, sometimes we don't go to our go to somebody who's offended us because the truth is that it's our problem. It's our preference, and things weren't done our way, so we got offended about it. And so we just, mm. well, I'm going to be the bigger person and let it go. But we don't actually let it go. We just let it stew, and then we go to, our, go to all our friends and tell them about how we were wronged. So the first question, is, is it your preference? We typically will not follow through on conflict if it's just a preference, and we realize that. And through the course of going, and we're talking with them, and we're talking and listening to, we are realizing maybe that we were convinced that something was uh, not a preference, and then it was. And the problem is that sometimes we think our preference is what's right. We think that our view is is synonymous with God. So... uh, there was a guy at, at one church I was um, ministering at who was convinced that women shouldn't speak in church at all. That was his preference, and he really thought that it was God's preference too. And so he took a scripture and he twisted it to kind of try and um, mean something that it never was meant to mean. Uh, and uh, so obviously he ended up leaving because the conflict was this. You have to change and stop all women from talking in the church or else I'm leaving. Well, so he left. Um, Another thing I can think of is a very common thing. People shouldn't wear hats in the house of God, so it's okay to rant and rave and talk down to the people who wear hats in a church, and it's okay to have a bad attitude, but it's not okay for them to wear a hat. It's like, that's a huge level of hypocrisy. I don't know if people just don't realize that the Old Testament priests wore head coverings when they were ministering in in the temple, but they were. And uh, or maybe maybe the idea of oh they shouldn't be here they're defiling the house of God here's the thing we are the house of God not a place so uh, another thing that I want to point out is don't let it fester it says if your brother sins against you go tell him his fault go don't wait for it to turn into a bad attitude deal with it we always tell ourselves these little lies like oh I'll deal with it later it's not as big of a deal but it's like well evidently it is a big deal Um, And the last thing here, don't go to others. It says here, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. Just the two of you go and talk it out. And, you know, it doesn't need to be everybody else's business. Just because they did something that made you upset or whatever, it doesn't mean you need to go and tell everybody else or talk to everybody else about it. That doesn't need to happen. Um, So in the next lesson, uh, we're going to talk about how to never have conflict. If you're like, hey, that sounds too good to be true. Tune in next time.